All right, everybody, thank you so much for joining us and welcome to Helix Education's webinar series. Today we are talking about online student experience and engagement, but more specifically, we'll be talking about student retention in a pandemic. My name is Carly Pace and I'm an operations manager here at Helix Education and I will be moderating our discussion today. Uh, before we jump into things, just a quick couple of housekeeping items to go over. Um, if you've been with us for previous webinar webinars, you're probably familiar with our routine, but if you haven't, uh, just a couple things to keep in mind. We are recording this webinar and it'll be available on our Helix Education YouTube channel. We'll also be sending out a link to all of you who have attended. And so in addition to the recording, we'll have a live transcript of this webinar through a service called Otter AI. Uh, if you look in the chat, you'll see that Miranda has posted a link to that live transcript. Um, it's a service that we offer if you'd like to take advantage of. We will have a question and answer portion of this webinar towards the end of today's proceedings. So if at any time during the webinar you have a question, you can click on that Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen and submit your question. We do already have a few questions that have been submitted ahead of time, so thanks to everybody who's already contributed. Um, and again, that feature is available at any time. Uh, if you have any technical difficulties or things like that, please utilize the chat. Um, and any other questions about what you're seeing or hearing, use that Q&A function. Um, so this is the latest installment in our series. If you've been with us for the journey to fall 2020, we are pretty far down the road, as you can see. Uh, we're gonna get a little bit more detailed towards the end of today's session in terms of what the different pillars are and why we're on the roadmap we're on and how we're going to touch on different areas each week. But for this specific week, we are focused on online student ex experience and engagement. So with that, um, I would love to, and I'm very honored to be presenting today's uh, presenter to you. This is Miranda Benson. Uh, she has been doing this for 14 years, uh, 14 exciting years, as she says, um, which that's probably a little bit of an understatement. Um, Miranda is incredibly skilled at working with and engaging uh, non-traditional adult students and helping them to achieve quality outcomes, um, specifically online. I have had the pleasure to work with Miranda for just over four years, um, and she is truly a gifted leader um, and very driven, and so I am very excited for her to be presenting what she has to say today. Uh, so with that, Miranda, I'm going to go ahead and turn the time over to you to get into this topic and help our attendees understand, um, you know, student retention in a pandemic. Thank you, Carly, and thank you again, everyone, for welcoming me back for our 11th webinar with Helix Education. Recently, we asked you for suggestions around some of the topics that you would like to see covered. And one area that you wanted to discuss was how we can retain students better and how on earth we do that in the middle of a global pandemic. A couple weeks back, my colleagues Sharon and Adam discussed some of the critical must-haves in successful operations management. And I cannot emphasize enough how the recommendations made in that webinar are some of the cornerstone foundational items for optimal retention strategy. For most universities, we are six weeks out from the start of our fall term, which is by far the largest start of the year for most of us. And I anticipate that many of you are here because you know that in addition to the critical component of enrolling and recruiting new students into your university, re-entering and retaining your existing student population is the single most important performance outcome uh, determining your success this academic year. Retention uh, strategy is a webinar series in and of its own. So today we hope that you walk away with some quick wins, critical, relevant, and effective techniques that you can put into place relatively quickly as you're preparing for the fall term. Secondly, we're going to revisit our coaching culture and discuss how these techniques layer in. 
I'll start by saying that much of our retention strategy is a framework. It is vital that you are, that you've taken a pulse on what the key obstacles are for your student base, whether that be by way of your student demographics or by understanding some of the roadblocks within your admissions practices and operational processes that impede student progress. It absolutely could be a combination of both. Today, we're going to talk about what some of the students are saying regarding their current experience and some of the hints that they're giving you about how you can support them better. We're going to talk about some of those seemingly innocent operational practices that, while good intentioned, could be creating barriers for your students. And finally, probably what you came for, we're going to talk about some of the quick wins that you still have time to implement that are really going to set your students up for success in the fall. And then of course you get to ask me some questions and hopefully I can give you additional insight that might be helpful. So without further ado, what are our students saying? So we discussed survey results back in the culture of coaching webinar, but it, just as a quick reminder, there have been a handful of student surveys ranging from 500 student participants to 25,000 student participants. And everyone is really just interested in getting an idea of what, of what students are planning to do for fall, what they need, and how we are doing so far. So let's quickly revisit what we've learned from the current survey data about some of those retention red flags that the students are waving for us. They've said that their mental and emotional health are suffering and it's impacting their academic progress. Students have told us that they are struggling with time management and working and taking care of household responsibilities. They are still having concerns around their finances and they're still questioning if this online experience is worth the bill that they're paying. One thing that we're gonna dive deeper into today is some data that uh, supports that students who have less privileged identities, experiences, and backgrounds are experiencing these stresses and worries about the COVID-19 pandemic more acutely. Now, prior to our huge global pandemic, this is what we know about the top 10 challenges to student success. Researchers at North Carolina State designed and encouraged students to participate in the Revealing Institutional Strengths and Challenges survey. And they surveyed about 6,000 two-year college students from 10 different community colleges in multiple states. And what they found was that working and paying for expenses were the top two challenges that students said impeded their academic success. I know that many of you are not gonna find that that's surprising that work and expenses are at the top, but some of the other top 10 are pretty interesting. One of the big surprises for researchers was that parking was a barrier, that nearly 1,300 students cited this as a barrier to their success. And what the researchers hypothesized was that this again went back to the conflict of the extra effort and time related to finding parking as it coincided with a student's hectic personal or work schedule. Many students don't have the luxury of being able to arrive on campus an hour early just to look for available parking spaces. Another 1,300 students identified online classes as a challenge. A little over half of them reported difficulties with learning online, and another 44% said the lack of interaction with faculty is a problem for them. Nearly 40% of students said that they had problems keeping up because their online courses didn't have regular class times. Digging into the top three a bit further, 2,100 students said work was the largest challenge that they faced with 61% saying the number of hours that they worked didn't leave them enough time to study. And about 50% of students reported that their wages did not cover their expenses. We know that financial factors are often a key player in student success in college. Currently, only about 26% of the students from the bottom quartile of income finished their bachelor's degree within six years, compared to 59% of students from the top quartile. Students also reported having difficulty paying for living expenses, textbooks, tuition, and childcare. About 30% of students reported difficulty balancing family responsibilities with college, dealing with some of their family members and friends' health problems, and finding childcare. Among those who cited these personal problems, 11% said their family did not support them going to college. Again, 
important to emphasize that this survey data was collected prior to the pandemic. So we know that our current state of affairs have only aggravated some of these complex and hefty barriers for students. Some of the key areas that we must focus deliberate and intentional effort toward in the fall are our online instruction and academic quality in the classroom, creative ways to expand financial options for students, and the quality of the student services provided by our advisors and our administrators. In addition to the typical and perhaps very specific obstacles that your university encounters frequently with students, we have obstacles that are very specific to our continuing population as a result of the pandemic. One of the critical spaces that universities have an obligation to understand and address are your underserved populations and how COVID-19 has impacted these students more severely. On average, CDC data has found that communities of color, including Black, Latino, and the Indigenous communities, have a much higher rate of hospitalization and death as a result of COVID-19. We can and absolutely should anticipate that our students of color, our low-income and first-generation students, will need intentional and specialized support in making successful academic progress during this pandemic. Not only are these students more likely to have gotten sick directly as a result of COVID-19, but they're more likely to have an immediate family member who's been sick or passed away as a result of the pandemic. They are more likely to be an essential worker, have less sick time pay, or have issues around their health care. I cannot emphasize enough that this has to be an intentional conversation in developing resources to help remedy those gaps. Next. A percentage of your students might have truly desired the campus experience. They were okay with taking one or two online classes to satisfy certain degree requirements, but they did not envision being a completely online student. One of the challenges that all of our higher education institutions have at hand right now is that, to some extent, we are selling a silver lining experience. This obstacle is shifting even some of our more successful students into a less stable category for us. Another thing to consider is that some of our faculty and some of our courses are new to online. And you are absolutely going to have students that will raise up a red flag on their experience when they encounter the normal bumps and bruises that coincide with new implementation. We have spoken at length about some of the resources that Helix offers to support quality online delivery and instruction. And this is absolutely critical in your retention strategy, especially in the next academic year. And lastly, boy, are we in unchartered waters. Unchartered, choppy, unpredictable waters. Depending on where you live, the pandemic trends might be looking good one day, and then the next day they might skyrocket and be cause for concern. Aside from just the general concerns, anxiety, and stress that it causes all of us, including our students, this can impact our students in a very tangible way, including their kids' school reopening, postponing, or starting online again. It could impact their employment, and again, probably most critically, it could directly impact their health. Before we jump into techniques to implement, it's important to consider what is holding us back from success in student retention. It's important to note that even if you have historically trended well year over year with student retention, you should give thought to changing some practices and implementing these techniques with consideration to our current environment. In working with our current partners with re-entering former students into classes, one of the huge deal breaker Barriers for many students are balance holds, barring them from future registration. In some cases, students might have withdrawn from a previous course and not realize the implications until it was too late. And this is a really tricky scenario because it's not unreasonable for universities to expect their students pay their out-of-pocket expenses. It's not unreasonable for students to make successful academic progress when using federal financial aid funds. And it's not unreasonable to expect that students pay smaller balances and not continue to register and acquire huge balances. But one consideration for universities is to at least 
temporarily remove registration holds or raise the accounting thresholds to allow students to progress through courses while paying on an account balance. One of the threats that exists in all of our automation and technology implementation is an environment where students can and are expected to do much of everything online, usually in an effort to reduce the resources expended by our staff within the institution. And this is an ongoing battle for balance, as many staff members have limited bandwidth as it is, and many institutions are struggling with budget constraints. If at all possible, if you have students that are struggling with a class or are requesting a schedule or program change, or worse, considering withdrawal from the university, your process should start with a one-on-one -on -one interaction with a coach or advisor, or even a university designate that is trained to have skilled conversations and de-escalate students. While you can see how automation of schedule and program changes might be super convenient for both staff and students, the implication for a student making a rash decision with their academic plan could allow for far more harm than intended. And as we discussed in the first bullet point, oftentimes when we are exploring some of the financial issues that students encounter from dropping mid-course, we find that the student might have had other solutions available to them if only they had received guidance. So our recommendation is to automate and utilize technology where the risk and consequences are minimal but insert human support in critical conversations. One of the interesting dynamics that we have observed in retention was a dip in retention of adult and graduate students when transitioning from a cohort model to a traditional term model for specific programs. Part of the culprit that we found in this change was that in the cohort model, students received a long-term plan through to graduation with limited breaks and a firm graduation date. In the term model, students received a program plan that had designated areas for completion, but they could only register for one semester at a time. Now, the key here is not necessarily changing your institution from a term model to a cohort model, but making sure that your process does not narrow students in to see only the short term. And lastly, one question to ask is, do you have a retention approach? In some scenarios, your historical trends in retention may have not been very alarming, and so most of your approach might have been reactive in case by case. I would suggest that you consider developing a more formalized retention plan heading into fall, as spring was incredibly brutal for some institutions, and it's going to be really important to have outreach and re-engage some of those students who might have dropped earlier this year and making sure that they stick. So now that we've discussed some processes that we should change, what should we implement and what can we do very quickly before fall term? The first thing that should be on your checklist is a think tank with some of your university stakeholders. So your provost, your advisors, your recruitment, your technology team, your administrators, and of course your financial aid team. If you can, you should absolutely involve a current student or alumni to really round out this collaboration. One of the first steps in the process of this think tank is to identify what your students' barriers are. Any data that you have ready regarding why your students are dropping, what classes they are failing from, any information about risky programs or student background that seem to be an indicator will be incredibly helpful to you. Many universities had this information available and might have tremendous insight into the correlation and cause, having all of your stakeholders at the table helps you in two distinct ways. One, having the whole, at the whole team at the table helps you with blind spots and mitigates the risk that your retention strategy has tunnel vision. Two, you will undoubtedly have to implement some changes and having your team at the table discovering the problem together will help you with buy-in on the solutions. Of course, once you find the barriers, I'm sure that your team is going to have a ton of creative ideas to help support students to overcome those barriers. Even if one of your primary focuses is to address finances as a barrier, there might be multiple angles to approach the issue. Primary research groups surveyed about 33 retention administrators at colleges and university and found that about 37% of the colleges sampled had provided some financial aid to students in distress due to the pandemic. 
but another 20% of the respondents felt that they could adjust the terms of student loans as an effective way to help students during the pandemic as well. So one of the big ideas that came out of collaboration on a state level was a $61 million grant in Indiana dedicated to public institutions to improve their remote learning capabilities. So they help students with digital devices and hotspots that they needed to be successful during the term. One of the deliverables from this think tank should be a resource guide for students that's derivative directly from the very specific barriers that your university faces and how you lose the most students. It's important that students have access to this resource guide on your EDU and that you have text and email engagement that makes them aware of where they can find it. And most critically, advisors and administrative staff must be the subject matter experts on this resource guide. It's really important that they know all of the resources listed inside and out and how they pair with a specific barrier. Even better, you really want them to have additional insight, color, and context into how well the resources are working for other students. As a part of that think tank, you will absolutely identify students that are entering as a, in their first year with additional challenges and need additional support. So your first generation students, first time online students, uh, again, certain programs that might be um, a little bit trickier or maybe a lower high school GPA. You may also need to brainstorm what other indicators you need to evaluate for students that are currently in progress with courses. For example, is there a way for advisors to be alerted by a faculty member if a student is struggling or not attending courses? Having visibility to early grades and attendance information in a student's course gives advisors and the support team a good shot at early intervention. One component you're probably going to have to address with your team is their limited beliefs about what can be done with the operational process and support to students. In some cases, you might not have the technology to support an efficient risk management system, and some components might have to be manual. Faculty might not love the idea of involving an advisor when they have a concern about a student. We're not saying it's going to be easy, but a risk management system that requires your advisors to have outreach to students that are raising those red flags is vital to your success and retention. But it doesn't stop there. It's really important that all of your stakeholders, faculty, administrative staff, student affairs, and financial aid understand this plan so that they can redirect the student back to their advisor to assist with resources and support. And we have our last quick win. Um, and again, we have to address the elephant in the room. This fall term, whether implemented online or with safety precautions on campus, may not resemble the vision of what students expected their college experience to be in fall of 2020. Of course, our 2021 academic year has an increased rate of retention risk. College coursework is hard, and to some extent, we may have taken a lot of fun out of it. It is absolutely critical that we are motivating and inspiring students much more intentionally in this current environment. And what better way to motivate them than to show them their roadmap? One of the barriers that we discussed in our operational process is limiting our registration and our advisement for students to the short term. Only discussing the first couple semesters and limiting the conversation to satisfying certain degree requirements may fail to show the student the long-term plan. If there is any way that you can register for the whole academic year, and even better, give students an idea of what their schedule could look like for their entire degree program, you can really get the student excited about the plan. One of the critical components for the advisor is explaining how the coursework, including some of those prerequisites, and the overall alignment of the schedule works to get the students graduated as quickly as possible. When the students understand how everything fits in together, you can overcome obstacles such as wanting to take time off from classes because of a little bit busier of a schedule or a smaller family vacation, because this is a part of what the advisor and the student will discuss in developing the roadmap. Will students still drop or want a change of schedule? Absolutely but planning over the long term is a great way to set expectations and inspire a student to consider other solutions that are not gonna impact their graduation date. 
It is so critical to retention success to make sure that these techniques are layered in with our foundations of coaching that we covered in webinar seven. The first component of our coaching foundation teaches us to see the student instead of the scenario. So each student is going to bring in their own experience with them into the degree program, which means every student has their own learning experience. Our goal is for our coaches to have a proactive approach to be supportive to students through life coaching, academic coaching, and career coaching, and to set these expectations in their very first coaching session with their new student. Next, we use RISE, which is the coaching approach we aim to use in each and every one of our coaching interactions with prospective and current students. The four components of RISE include building rapport, inquiring, supporting, and empowering. Lastly, a third component of our coaching fundamentals is speed, which helps us remember the important steps to cover and working through an academic detour. So facts, explore, evaluate, and then decide. It is critical that all of your student-facing staff are trained in the coaching approach so that your students feel heard and supported through their academic journey. The cool part about layering in the coaching culture with these techniques is that because your staff is taking the time to provide life coaching, ask thought-provoking questions, and help students overcome challenges in the feed process, they can provide invaluable insight in the think tank and help you quickly identify your most common barriers and what resources your students are asking for and need the most. With your resource guide and early risk management process, your advisors will be helping support your students to get them to the right place at the right time, whether it be back to their faculty member to discuss a certain grade, getting them to utilize the writing center regarding the paper that is causing them a great deal of anxiety, or taking advantage of mental health services if they are very stressed. In conclusion, many of you have asked me about coaching skills and training tips, and I'd say the most critical component of getting your team to implement a retention strategy is to make sure that you have a published retention goal and regular access to progress to that goal for all stakeholders. Oftentimes, we find that a university does a great job with setting a goal, but the behavioral expectations of the staff are unclear. Or on the other hand, a university might do a great job of setting clear cut expectations for staff um, and there's really good processes and strategies, but the team has no idea how they are doing towards the goal and if their efforts are fruitful. Both are extremely important. One other way that you can increase retention and influence your team to create an environment where students thrive is to humanize the student experience. Ask your students for their stories and share them with your staff regularly through emails, through meetings, and even through marketing engagement. Humanizing the student experience is one easy way to influence your staff to become more transformational in their student service. And lastly, of course, some of you who attended my last webinar know that I am the biggest fan of holding space for observing the student experience every single day. So if you make that important, your team will make it important. And we know that excellent student service drives student outcomes. And now you get to ask me some questions. Perfect. Thank you so much, Miranda, for everything you've shared with us so far. Um, we did get a handful of questions prior to um, the webinar starting. So if you're joining us just a little bit late, that's totally fine. You can use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to type in your question. Um, Miranda, I think that we talked about this a little bit earlier just in your presentation, um, but Sandra asked a question, and I think this is important because I think that a lot of us are probably feeling this way to some extent right now, given our current situation, um, but how do you support students who are stressed and just wish to take a break because they cannot remain focused at this time? That is really tricky. And we did talk about that a bit. And especially we know that certain populations um, are really feeling this pretty, um, pretty hard. And so what I would say is that the biggest piece of this is to get ahead of it with students. And that's why I'm such a big advocate for coaching and, and seeing our advisors as 
coaches versus people that kind of help students through these transactional processes because the big piece is getting students resources and help and, and having a connection with them before they become so overwhelmed that they believe that the only, the only option is to drop from classes. Um, and so checking in and having that one-on-one -on -one relationship with students and asking them questions about how they're feeling and, and really tapping into some of that stress and providing resources for students, even if it's suggestions around podcasts to listen to, books to read, um, again, any mental health resources that your university offers, that's so critical. That early intervention is so critical. Um, and I think by the time a student tells you that they're dropping, you've got to understand they have been thinking about this for several weeks. And so if you have people that are regularly providing some kind of outreach and connection to students, usually they can intervene and really prevent the student from escalating. Wonderful. Thanks for that answer, Miranda and Sandra. Thank you for submitting that question, Great question. to us. Um, another question that we got, um, and I think this will be interesting as schools continue their transition and, and depending on what fall 2020 is going to look like. Um, do you have any suggestions? Peter asked us a question. How can you onboard freshmen um, in online learning during this pandemic? Oh, that's so tough. And that is the crowd that I'm thinking of the most when I talk about the campus experiencing the experience not being their first choice, right? That um, for these students, they had this idea of what college was going to look like, and they're so excited. And then to find themselves, you know, back in their bedroom at their desk doing college online, it's just very, very different. And And I'm and I'd say probably very disappointing for a lot of students. And so um, I know we talked in other webinars about ways to engage students. So ideas such as coffee chats and things that bring the fun back to the freshman experience, um, even though they can't be face to face. Um, and another piece might be to really promote and make the new freshman aware of some of the activities that you plan to bring back post pandemic when it is safe um, so that they understand that this is short term and that that hopefully uh, at some point during their four years that they are going to be experiencing um, some of the fun and some of that face to face interaction that they anticipated or at least they plan to. So I would say coming up and making freshmen aware of what your college rep represents and what kind of activities you do in a typical scenario and the things that you're excited about. I would say creating activities that somewhat mimic that experience. So whether it be coffee chats or, you know, um, any kind of happy hour things that might be appropriate for um, freshmen coming in. And again, that human connection. Again, I can't emphasize enough that having advisors have more frequent conversations and tapping into how the students might be feeling one-on-one -on -one is really going to solidify um, the experience for some of your freshmen that are starting this year. Perfect, that's great. I think that also covers um, a couple of additional comments that we had come in prior to the webinar, really where people were just asking you know, how you go about having a fresh perspective while we're in this virtual or online experience um, and how to add additional ways to really enhance the student's motivation for the course. And I love that you keep going back to the human connection, right? And focusing on, on coaching um, and getting people to engage that way. Um, we did get another question from Sandra, and I, I think also we covered this a little bit as you were talking through what's, what we're hearing from students, right? Um, but maybe you have something to add. She's asking, what suggestions do you have when the major factor impacting student retention is the inability to pay associated fees at this time or the time of registration or class start? This is so tricky. I know I'm saying this to every question. It's all very tricky, um, but I, I can't emphasize enough that the think tank is necessary because um, when you get different people in the room and the goal is to really think creatively 
and try to understand the problems that you're having and to, you know, whiteboard I, some creative ideas about how you can solve those problems. That's really where you're going to push out of the comfort zone. I think um, it, that's tricky in today's environment for all of us via Zoom, but, um, but the problem is, is it's not one individual on campus that's going to solve that problem. It's not the accounting department. It's not just the financial aid office. It truly is going to be all of your stakeholders at the table and really having no dumb ideas, really focusing on wild ideas that are going to push you out of your comfort zone. Um, because a big piece of this truly is the financial uh, component for many students. And so, um, you know, before you kind of cross off the board that uh, minimizing the fees or even taking the fees away for the academic year might be, you know, um, too big of a decision, I would put it on the table, right? I, I would say that for many students, um, their university's willingness to be flexible and their willingness to um, support students in that way can go a long way where students might be more willing to stay with your university remembering kind of that level of support and that level of engagement during this really tricky time. So I would say that that is going to be every university and institution's number one issue in this upcoming academic year. Um, is really addressing some of those financial gaps. And I would say that any level of flexibility that you can provide students um, in understanding some of their hardships is going to be really, really important to um, your retention success. Perfect. Thank you. Um, I, I know internally we've talked about this a lot. We just had a question come in from Ryan. Um, I know Sharon talked about this a little bit in one of our past webinars, um, but a lot, of, a lot of people are asking, what about hands-on courses while we're in this pandemic, right? And how do we kind of incorporate a strategy um, to maintain engagement and enrollment in those types of classes where the hands-on part is missing? Yeah. Really tricky. Um, I would say that one of, you know, in, in historically with online, I think we've really focused on the flexibility for adult and graduate students. And so in most of the um, modality now you see um, asynchronous learning um, and structure. I would say, you know, with certain classes, really consider maybe meeting times and synchronous delivery so that um, everybody is engaged and in classes and maybe some level of demonstration might be an idea. Um, another piece of this that we've seen is that students after the spring term really are desiring to speak with their facilitator or their faculty member. So really extending those office hours are going to be incredibly crucial in the fall term and maybe even making it be a regular part of how you manage um, your online class. So instead of it being something where the students just can call you if they need something, maybe you host groups um, once a week where you have two or three students and you plan a time to connect with them and talk with them about the class. Really the cool thing about where we are today is that we have so many different options that we can really be creative about how we do this. We have a license to throw new ideas um, on the board and, and see how it helps students. And so um, I would say that again, um, really connecting the student to a person, whether that be your faculty member and advisor is going to be really helpful in one servicing the student and then also tapping into what your specific needs are and then you also have the opportunity to solicit students for what they actually want so if you have um, people asking students questions and diving into their obstacles you're really going to get some great feedback um, but i would say the demonstrations um, might be super helpful with some of those hands-on classes Definitely making sure that um, you're integrating some specific class times into certain classes where it's more helpful and then opening up office hours. 
Yeah, super important. That's great. Thank you. Um, we just had something come in from, I hope that I say this right and don't mispronounce this, but uh, from Hugh. Uh, first, they said, thank you very much for sharing, Miranda, and are wondering, what are some of the strategies that um, you've used to help students to read their emails, newsletter, or bulletin boards so that they can get the information and recourses that colleges are trying to promote? Ah, yes. So, um, one, I guess it kind of depends on the email delivery. If we're talking about the, the general um, engagement that's sent out from the university, that can be really tricky. Um, I would say that hopefully to some extent your marketing department has analytics on what your, your open rates are and can give feedback about ways to kind of creative ways to catch your students' attention. Um, I would say that what generally what I found is that students um, receiving emails from their facilitator, their faculty member, specifically from an advisor, generally do better in terms of opening up. And what I would say is there's a call to action. So you are asking your student to respond and make sure that they've understood something. Sometimes some cool, like fun ways that you can um, get students to read certain emails um, is maybe have prizes, right? That's something that we've seen done at other universities that have been incredibly successful. Um, do little quizzes about understanding the information and get entered in for a raffle might be fun. Um, and again, some follow up around whether students have received the email information. So if you have some analytics on maybe who's opened it and who has not opened it, you can then do some further follow up. Text is also a great way. Um, so if you um, send out some engagement and then follow it up with a text, a lot of times our current uh, student demographic is a little bit more receptive to text. Um, and especially if whatever you are sending out via email can be linked in the text, obviously that's a huge, um, that, you know, provides a lot of accessibility for students that are on the go. So text, this is what it is, link to item, and then they can read directly from their phone. So um, those are some suggestions that I have about how you can get students to um, make sure that they're opening up your emails and also reading them. Um, that hopefully might be helpful. That's great. Thank you, Miranda. Um, Raphael just wrote in um, and says he believes that it's important to maintain a foundation for the coping skills and to help students, you know, to engage, keep a good sleep hygiene, nutrition, and self-care to improve both their mental and emotional health. Any tips from you, Miranda, or your experience to maintain a, a good mental health condition, which is so important, right, to focus on our students during this time? Oh, I love that so much. And I would say that, again, um, to some extent, it's about assessing your students. So however you best can do that, if you have the bandwidth for your advisors to, um, to connect with students and get kind of an assessment of how the students are feeling and coping. Um, if you need to go out and do maybe some assessment or survey on, um, on that subject for your student base, um, and that might be a little bit more efficient for you, you could do it that way. But one of the cool things is, is sometimes, um, and generally within your health courses, there's some curriculum around that. So if there's any way to incorporate some students that um, raise a red flag and say that they're having issues around it, it might be a possibility to actually enter them into one of your health courses that you know has some curriculum around coping. Um, and then to some extent, um, they're, they're managing those, right? They're, they're getting some credit completion and also learning those coping skills. So, um, so I think that that's awesome. Again, I, I think in this time, it's incredibly important. So if you have any component of coping and time management and stress, management in your new student orientation. That's a fantastic way to help students be prepared for the start of the fall term and also learn some ways to um, cope as they're running into obstacles um, as we know that they will. So I would say new student orientation, if you can, um, if it is appropriate for that student to be enrolled in a health class that offers um, a component of mental health um, Coping, that would be an awesome way. 
um, to provide students some resources. And then if you offer mental health services as a part of um, your, your university resources, then absolutely connecting the students to that resources is helpful as well. Yeah, that's great. And that may be um, something that you utilize those newsletters or the emails or, you know, a, a bulletin board type feature as you're communicating with your students. So um, I think that is awesome. Um, we had a question come in from Peter um, and he's wondering, how do you deal with, you know, possible enrollment procrastination uh, from some of these students who are they they wanted on ground courses right they wanted that on campus experience and so maybe they are are waiting or hoping for the resumption of face to face learning so any thoughts on how you might um, approach that Miranda uh, so I would say that I always say the best defense is a good offense I'm not much of a sports fan but I do remember that quote from somewhere and um, and I would say is again the early questions about the student's motivation to earn their degree and what their personal timeline looks like is so important and that i think when students are in a space where they're considering procrastination um a lot of times they are not considering how this maps out to you know four years later or two years later depending on how many credits the student has completed already and ultimately um I would say that one of the things to explain to students is that we're all kind of managing online right now. It is not just from an academic standpoint. We are all working from online or many of us are working online. Many of us are learning creative ways to be successful and have interaction and have that human connection from afar. And so whereas previously being a ground campus student might have been a preference, this online modality really is something that the students can add as a tool in their toolbox for the way that they might manage professionally later on. And so, um, so I would say that ultimately in the past, many students have not really loved their online experience and have strictly wanted to go to the ground campus. But I think um, to be a very, to be a well-rounded student and in consideration of transitioning to the outside professional world, being able to be successful um, and navigate online is really, really important to, to their own personal progression. And so I think um, explaining that piece to students um, and helping them see that vision is really important. But I also think really um, driving home the roadmap and how much they actually can get completed um, in the course of a year, an academic year, um, versus waiting and then being a year behind, right? So um, if students see the vision of how quickly they can get their degree completed and what that means for them professionally, then they might be more, more likely to get started versus delaying because we really don't know when this is going to end. Yeah, that's a, a great point. Um, thank you for that. Um, thank you, everybody, for asking such wonderful questions today. Um, Miranda, with the little bit of time that we have left, um, do you want to go ahead and share what resources we have made available on our website for folks attending the webinar, for them to share with you know others at their institutions that may be helpful for them? Yeah, so um, as many of you may have seen, we offer online support for online education in four unique pillars, um, institutional online readiness, the online teaching and learning experience, the online student experience and engagement, and then the student and parent expectation management pillar. Um, many of you have attended our previous webinars, but if this is your first time, we want you to know that we offer a wide range of resources and we can help. Um, and I know that many of you are trying to get this experience for students right for fall, but might have concerns that you don't have the time, you don't have the experience, you don't have the resources to get on track. And that's what we can help you with and what we bring to the table. We have guides, rubrics, and templates 
um, to support your online transition and whether it be support in your online modality specifically, improving the student experience inside or outside the classroom or messaging to parents and students, we have specific resources designed to help that need. Um, so you're gonna be able to find the assessment rubrics, templates, how-to guides, a starting place for helpful benchmarks and KPIs, all at your fingertips on our website. So that's helixeducation.com backslash new dash future, or you can email newfutureinfo at helixeducation.com. Perfect. Then I'll turn it back to Carly. Perfect. Thank you so much, Miranda. Um, so like she said, all of those resources are available at that www.helixeducation.com forward slash new dash future. Um, and that new future info at helixeducation.com that goes to a group of us here. Um, we will make sure that the, the most qualified person gets in contact with you. And so I've put those um, resources in the chat for you. Really, we just want to let you know that we are here. We're also going through this, right? Um, we're here to help. Um, so this has been great. We really hope that you will join us for our next webinar, which will be next week, um, as we dive a little bit more into um, online student, um, I'm sorry, as we jump into student and parent expectation management. Um, so that will be happening next week. We will definitely be sending a recording of this webinar out to you today. So expect that a little bit later this afternoon. Thank you again for joining us and for such great questions. Uh, again, Miranda, thank you for being such a wonderful presenter and for sharing all of your knowledge and tips and tricks with us. Um, so in the meantime, uh, I hope everybody has a wonderful week. Stay safe um, and we will see you next week. Thank you, everyone.